All right. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the Entrepreneurial Lunch and Learn by the Field Center for Entrepreneurship at Boone College. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, today's session, Career Development for New Entrepreneurs, How to Practice Powerful Networking that Builds Your Brand and Tells an Authentic Story, is presented by Lauren Graham. Lauren is the founder and CEO of Velvet Frame. Lauren is an environmental entrepreneur with a background in green building and sustainable design. Her expertise in aligning philosophy, strategy, and practice makes her the right person to help entrepreneurs develop their own impact strategy, building on your own personal story. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your expertise with us. Also, Lauren is a adjunct lecturer at Baruch in the Management Entre Entrepreneurship Program as well. So, and that is new for you this year, right? So thank you. So you're giving back so much to us. So I really appreciate you spending your time with us today too. Thank you, Marlene, and welcome everyone. Um, my name again is uh, Lauren Graham. I have the pleasure of teaching social entrepreneurship this semester. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll recognize some of you on this call. So my goal for today is to take the first 20 to 30 minutes or so, just going through some of the high level structural questions around how to network effectively, how to tell an authentic story and what it means to build your network in a way that helps advance your entrepreneurial goals. So to start off, I wanna do a quick poll just so that I have a sense of what you're all looking for uh, out of this uh, time that we're sharing today. Okay, go ahead and vote. Okay, starting to come in, there we go. Okay, give it another 10 seconds or so. Okay, so for the first question, what is your networking style? For most of you, you said that you don't actively network. So hopefully today you'll get some practical tips about how to start that networking journey. And if you've been a little hesitant about it, uh, you'll have some sense of how to get started in a way that feels comfortable and authentic for you. And then for the second question, my number one goal for improving my networking is to, uh, the most popular answer was find and connect to the right people. And then some of you also said to learn to maintain relationships formed through networking. So we'll talk about all of that. If you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box as they come up. I'll scan between and uh, we'll use the rest of the time for the second half of today to just openly brainstorm. So please feel free to uh, share something about your personal experience and then we can dialogue. Chances are if someone else has, uh, if you have that question, someone else also has that question as well. And just sharing the results. So first off, I'll just tell you a, a little bit about me uh, and then tell you about the power of stories. So networking sometimes for people feels really uncomfortable. It's really awkward. You have a business card and you're trying to figure out how to jump into a conversation, but really networking at its core is about telling stories, stories about yourself, your professional journey, your personal journey, and then integrating those stories into a broader uh, trajectory for your career. Then we'll talk a little bit about Networking 101. And since I'm guessing many of you are business students or you're thinking about starting your own enterprise, maybe you already have your own enterprise, thinking about clients and how do you engage clients, that's always the question that I get. Um, my background is mainly in consulting, so I have a slightly different experience than someone who is running a brick and mortar business or providing a, a specific product or good as opposed to a service, but we'll just talk a little bit about clients. And then I have a couple quick little exercises that you can work on now, or you can take a screenshot and then uh, work on it on your own time. And then of course the balance of time is for Q&A. 
So about me, as Marlene mentioned, um, I'm the founder of Velvet Frame. I'm a social impact consultancy, and my focus is on working with organizations across the environment and social impact spectrum on a range of capacity building and change management challenges. So for some organizations, that means doing their strategic planning. For others, it's around communications or operations. So what I really tend to focus on are the internal nitty gritty challenges that particularly early stage organizations have that might stand in the way of them being able to grow and develop and become more scalable and sustainable. In that space, uh, I tend to work more with nonprofits or uh, smaller stage social enterprises or earlier stage social enterprises. But in general, I'm pretty open to the type of organization as long as they are working to make the world a better place. Uh, my expertise falls into three areas. One is environment and sustainability. It's a lovely shot of uh, planet Earth. Also social impact. So anything that is social impact, social innovation, social entrepreneurship is my space. And then also creative media. Uh, it's a pair of VR goggles there. I've worked on VR projects and also using games and film and any sort of creative media for public engagement. Uh, my idea was really to go into spaces that really help to build agency for people, to excite them, to energize them, and to help them feel connected to a problem solving. Teaching, of course, uh, teaching social entrepreneurship at uh, Zicklin this semester, and I also lecture at Penn School of Social Policy and Practice as well. Um, my background, I have a few master's degrees, and I'm a very social science oriented person. And I've really thought about using my education, not in a plug and play format, uh, because for me, it's not uh, about education as a commodity. It's about using it as a tool to broaden my horizon and create opportunities for networking and to move between different spaces. I don't really have a traditional career background. I've worked in, uh, in creative work, uh, like documentary film. I've done some international work as well, uh, consulting for myself, consulting for other companies, for-profit and nonprofit. So really thinking about how to activate your education and turn that into opportunities, particularly through your alumni network is something that we're gonna talk about today. So to start off, uh, in terms of thinking about entrepreneurship, it's, it's a hot topic. Uh, entrepreneurship is sexy. The idea of owning your own business or running your own enterprise is something that a lot of people aspire to do. Uh, but the question that I always have for anyone who's interested in entrepreneurship is to really ask yourself and, and write it down. Why do I want to be an entrepreneur? It might seem really exciting, you get to be your own boss, but it also means that you're wearing so many different hats at the same time. And that process of understanding what is motivating you, where the opportunities are for you, that's a really key thing. Because you might be creative and innovative, but you can also be an entrepreneur. You can be someone who joins a larger company and is utilizing the resources and the capacity that they already have in order to make change. So the second question to ask yourself is what is the pain point or problem I am looking to solve and answering the question of so what. So when it comes to a, a pain point or a problem, if you're an entrepreneur, you're trying to solve a problem, and that might be a really big problem of consequence, like how do you address homelessness uh, if you're a social entrepreneur, but it can also be something that is is more of a, a problem of convenience. And at the end of the day, you're still trying to solve a problem. And particularly if you're selling a product, you have to convince the potential consumer why your product is better than something else that's on the market. Or if you are a first mover, why you are solving a problem that can be solved. And sometimes that involves a level of consumer education before you can even jump in. So when we're thinking about solving problems, you have to say, well, where's the point of intervention? Do I wanna be the person who creates the technology or platform or system on the back end? Do I wanna be someone who engages directly with the public? Do I want to provide something that is only an e-commerce or online based service? Another question is, what is my relationship to risk and failure? 
if you know anything about entrepreneurship, you know that entrepreneurs say that it is so hard and you are going to fail and people are going to tell you no all the time. And for some people, that's just not really the space that they want to be in. They don't want to always be pushing the proverbial boulder up the hill. So thinking about what kind of risk you are comfortable with, if you are willing to start a business that might be successful in one measure, but not necessarily profitable. So entrepreneurship is a, an avenue, it's a pathway, but you can get to achieving your professional goals without entrepreneurship necessarily being the strategy. So another question, am I offering something new and is it all is someone already doing it better than me? Uh, sometimes we have to be a little humble and say, you know, my approach might be interesting, it might be good, but at the same time, if there's someone who is producing a better product, if they're better positioned, is this really the right space for me? So again, going back to the question of solving problems or finding a good point of intervention, that's a really critical piece because you don't want to get into a space that is completely oversaturated or you have an interesting idea, but you don't have the different pieces that you need to move it forward. Another question, would I do this if money were no object? Of course, we all you know, want to have comfortable lifestyles. We want to make sure that we can make money and be self-sufficient doing whatever we do professionally. But if you think about entrepreneurship and the drive that it takes to keep you going when things are really tough, uh, if you took money off of the table, is this something that you would want to do? Is the only reason that you are in it because of money or because you know other people who have been successful in that space? So just understanding your relationship to money, to profit, uh, your desire to fundraise, let's say if you're going for a, like a startup kind of model of entrepreneurship, just understanding that relationship to money early on is key. And then finally, who do I want in my tribe? So you can't control what the field looks like. You are one person. Your goal is to try to do the work that you are interested in doing as best as you can. But if you say, like, I can't imagine being around fill in the blank personality type, then it's something to consider. Or you might be thinking about how to do your work, not necessarily in the traditional space, like if you were going into tech, you don't have to be in Silicon Valley or in the Bay Area to be successful in tech. You could think about tech in education or in other places where it's needed, but maybe you are providing contrast because your background and experience is not exactly the same as everyone else. So just thinking about with networking as well, why you want to be around a certain type of person? Who do you want to be associated with you? What kind of community do you want to be in? So just some general questions to get your mind going. So now I'm going to talk about the power of stories. And I mentioned before that stories are a really critical way for you to think about sharing what is important about your life experience, why you are interested in a particular career path. And when you are in school and you're a student, figuring out how to talk about yourself as a work in progress can be a little bit daunting. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the power of stories, the importance of good storytelling as a backbone to networking and how that can help you as an aspiring entrepreneur. So why stories matter? So stories can connect, validate, inspire, and empower. Storytelling is one of those things that is so uh, integral to all cultures. Every culture has a history of storytelling. It is a way of leveling the playing field, connecting human to human and not based on a, a different or arbitrary hierarchy. But stories are part of an emotional appeal. Facts matter. It's important, especially in the time that we're living in, to stick with facts. But facts alone do not move people. Facts alone do not encourage a venture capitalist or an angel investor to write a check to fund your business. It's about ideas. People get motivated by ideas and by possibilities. Those are the kinds of things that get people going and have them believe in you. Especially when you're a new entrepreneur, you don't necessarily have a prototype or a pilot. So people are buying into you and your personal story. So if your story is maybe something like mine, uh, you're the child of two immigrants, you grew up in New York, you, uh, you know, had to kind of pull yourself up and develop a, a pathway to uh, networking and to building systems that could work for you, then that is part of your story. So everyone has something interesting to share about who they are and where they are in their particular point in the journey. 
So stories and learning how to tell your story um, orally, like what your 30 second elevator pitch would be, writing it down and being able to share it on, for example, a LinkedIn profile, all of those um, important things about stories and where those stories show up and how you control the narrative that's underlying your stories. Uh, that's a, a key part that will help make networking a lot easier for you as you move on. So I briefly wanna talk about identity and impact statements. And this is my phrasing uh, for what I call mission, vision, theory of change, value proposition, and a positioning statement. So I've been toggling a little bit between talking about yourself as an individual and how to tell your own story and why stories matter in networking. But if you're talking about your business, you're leveraging a piece of your own personal experience as you're talking about why your product or service is great and should be successful in the marketplace. But it's important to have a personal mission, like what drives you, what is your personal purpose, but then your business can also have a mission. If you're someone who's interested in environmental issues or social justice issues, this is especially important. So as we're thinking about how to write down some of these key things about stories, how to put it in a package that you can more easily convey to uh, the public or to anyone in a networking sense, these are a couple of the ones to think about. So your mission is your why. What do you exist to do? And that complements your vision. And your vision is the better future that applies meaning to your purpose. So the mission is what you exist to do. The vision is what is different if you are successful. So if you are running, let's say, a small tech company that creates uh, networking opportunities for small business owners in New York City. The vision could be that every small business owner in New York City has access to more tools uh, as if they were a larger organization to be able to reach customers, partner with other businesses and have access to capital. So you have to really present that vision of a better future, something that is motivating and inspiring in order, to people get to, for, in order for people to get on board. Then you have your theory of change and your theory of change is the methodology. It is this idea that is underlying what you're doing. So your theory of change could be something like, if I create a better running shoe, then people would be less likely to throw out their old shoes and that would reduce the amount of uh, waste that goes into a landfill. So you're making a set of assumptions about how people are going to behave under a particular set of conditions. And a theory of change, whether or not it is clearly articulated or not, is something that is always driving your work. It's the theory of how do we get from point A to point B? How do we encourage people to go from a default uh, action or behavior to this new action or behavior? Uh, the theory that if I provide uh, better tacos at my taco truck than what is available in my neighborhood, then people would be willing to go an extra subway stop or two in order to buy my food as opposed to someone else's. So understanding the theory of what inspires action and change is also really important. And finally, the, the value proposition, which is a promise of value to be delivered to a customer or user. This is often linked in with marketing because everyone is looking for value. Just like I had on the, uh, the story slide, the question of so what, you might say, well, I have this awesome product and it's cheaper and faster and better and more amazing. And you should buy it from me because I'm a Baruch student. People might say, yeah, okay, so what? And getting over that so what often relates to understanding what the customer or consumer is really interested in. How are you solving their problem? How are you uh, addressing a pain point? How are you adding value in their life and doing it better than the alternative, than your competition? And that's where the positioning statement comes in because it's a compelling statement expressing how a product or service fills a need of a target audience. Whenever you're doing anything in an entrepreneurial space, you have to think about your audience. Your audience comes first. What is their demographic, their age, their gender, their race, their income level, where they're located geographically, what kinds of things that they like, what are the other similar products that they might buy, which would 
uh, lend some credibility to yours. So you're always thinking about how to position not only yourself as an individual and in, in a networking context, but you're also trying to figure out how to position your business at large. Now we're gonna talk about your brand story. Uh, I'm not a branding expert, uh, I'm not a marketing expert, but I think we all know that brands are really critical. Brand loyalty to a particular product or service is important, but then there's also your own personal brand, your own personal brand story. One thing that I always try to caution new entrepreneurs to consider is, is how to know your brand and control the story behind your brand, but don't make yourself a commodity. A commodity is something that is bought and sold and traded. The value increases or decreases based on the next best alternative. And you don't want to make yourself into someone who is transactional or someone who people see as being disposable. You're a human being, you're a dynamic, interesting person, and you want to make sure that you are presenting yourself in a way that is, uh, is amplifying your value and showing a level of confidence in what you bring to the table, but you don't want to make it a transactional experience when what you're really trying to get out of networking is a relationship. People don't have relationships with commodities. They might like them, they might enjoy them, it might solve a problem, but that's not the thing that really drives true and meaningful connection. So as you're thinking about how to tell your story, you don't want to make it something that people accept or reject. You want to keep it in the space of a brand that is exciting and a brand that people can connect to, but you're not a product in and of yourself. Next with your brand story, you wanna decide what authenticity means to you. And that could be a little bit different depending on your own personal story or what kinds of uh, entrepreneurial journeys you want to take. But authenticity is something that is really critical in the marketplace. So if you don't come across as being authentic, if you are not accurately or holistically representing whatever that community that you're a part of, people aren't necessarily going to trust you. And when you're thinking about entrepreneurship and particularly the fundraising side of it, what people often say is that it's better to fund an A team with a B idea than a B team with an A idea. And all that is to say is that people matter. You can come up with a new business venture. You might succeed, you might fail, you might grow your uh, empire and have many different businesses under your belt. But at the end of the day, it's about you. And if people trust you, if they like you, if they see you as being an authentic person, there will be a level of credibility that you will build up over time. And that's what you are going to be able to leverage in your network. If you're networking uh, with someone, you want them to say, well, uh, you know, you're a really great person, you're reliable, you're smart, you show up, you do what you say you're going to do. It's worth me opening up my network to help make a connection for you. And authenticity is a big part of that. Your brand story should also offer a call to action. If you are an entrepreneur, you never want to miss an opportunity to give a pitch. And of course, that pitch might not always be a, a formal kind of pitch or the kind of pitch that, uh, that you would do to a funder. But every connection, every relationship, every conversation is an opportunity to understand something about your target audience, to understand something about how people perceive you or how you are reflected. So you want to make sure that you leave people with a sense of a call to action. Is that call to action uh, having a a networking call or socially distanced coffee with you? Is it checking out your website? Is it uh, signing up to uh, be part of a test group for your prototype of your project or product? So just thinking about what, you're, what action you're asking people to take and how that series of action is going to help advance your entrepreneurial career is critical. You also want to continuously shape your value statement. And uh, value statement in particular, I think about uh, not just the value proposition and your mission and your vision, but also just the way that you come across to people. I have a value statement that I have on my resume because I use my resume more as a what I call a resume flyer. And it's a really condensed version of explaining what I know as opposed to all of the different things I've accomplished. So my value statement that I'd like to share with you, I say, I am a strategic ecosystems thinker who creates impact by transforming how mission-driven organizations are designed, led, and evolved. 
So I'm mentioning strategic because that is a big part of my work. It's strategy. Uh, as an ecosystems thinker, that's not only around my environmental training and background, but it's also the way that I approach problems. The what's in it for someone else, I create impact by transforming organizations and thinking about all steps of the process, the design process, the leadership process, and the evolution moving forward. So just thinking about how to constantly tweak that story, how to tell stories that are interesting, and making that brand something that people associate with you. So when they make a connection and say, oh, I, you know, Lauren is this environmental person, maybe this would be a useful connection for you. And also, I think maybe the most important thing within your brand story is to talk about what you are not where to draw the line and say, you no, know, like I say, I'm not a marketing person. I know a lot about marketing. I've done some design work before, but I'm not the person who you come to for that particular service with that particular attached skill set. You also want to define as an entrepreneur what you will say no to, and that might be taking funding from someone or an organization that is not in line with your values. It might be uh, saying that there are certain tribes that I don't want to associate with or don't want to work with. So just thinking about how to describe what you don't do, what you are not, who you don't engage with, so that you can draw a clear line between your side of the fence and the other side of the fence is also critical. So networking uh, 101, uh, from the poll that you've completed, uh, networking still seems like a little bit of a, of a new area. And maybe that's because you've had some of the awkward experiences of networking, or it hasn't been uh, necessarily fruitful for you. So you say, well, why do I need to spend my time networking? Uh, we live in a time where it's about systems and networks. It's not just about the ownership of materials or raw goods. It's about who knows that you know what you know. How can you get through to different people based on your own um, based on your own experience? So networking is also something that is within your control. You only have so many hours within the day. You are students. Um, you might be working as well. You have family obligations. We all have really complex lives that we're juggling. But networking is also a way of expanding your footprint. It's a way of getting uh, other folks to have eyes out for opportunities that you might not see based on where you are positioned in your life and your career. So hopefully by the end of this, you have uh, a more favorable view of networking and an, and an idea of how to do that authentically to meet your goals. So the, the first thing I'd like to talk about within networking is around LinkedIn and specifically social networking. So if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, I strongly encourage you to create one. It's free. Of course, there are up, upgraded tiers that you could pay for, but the free version works just fine. So LinkedIn, for those of you who are not familiar, is launched in 2003. Uh, there are five co-founders. The most uh, commonly known or popular one is uh, Reed Hoffman. Almost 60% of their users are between 25 and 34. So perhaps a little bit older than your demographic, but still it's not your grandma's social networking site. And uh, most of the, the markets, the largest market is the US with uh, roughly half of the American population on LinkedIn. And of course, LinkedIn is global. So there really aren't very many other alternatives to being able to create a digital space for yourself, to shape a platform, and then to be able to reach people. LinkedIn has been really uh, important for me and, and my career development because it allows uh, me to connect to people and to be able to show something about myself when I'm cold calling or cold networking. Being able to say, hi, I'm Lauren, this is what I'm about, this is why I'd like to talk to you, and including my link to my LinkedIn profile has been very valuable. So broadly thinking about social networking, not so much the TikTok, Instagram side of social networking, but the social networking that can directly benefit you on a professional level. So I, I mentioned this before, but, uh, but raising your profile and building credibility is huge. People want to know compared to the almost 8 billion people on the planet, why should I trust you? Why should I uh, spend time getting to know you? Why should you be someone who's part of my network? LinkedIn can help you move forward in that way. 
And networks are the foundation of collective action, whether that collective action is around something that is, is uh, justice or socially oriented, or it is just about reaching people in different places in their life, people uh, part of different, who are part of different demographics. Networks allow you to move large groups of people or to get attention from large groups of people. You of course want to curate and control your story and your narrative. And LinkedIn is a way of, of doing that. And it is also a platform for thought leadership. You can write an article and publish it on LinkedIn. And as you develop your, uh, your population of your, your network of people, then more people will see it. It's also a really great way of finding out about information that is relevant to your field. So you can join different groups and you can follow different people. So instead of you always having to actively go out and find information that's relevant to your area or the area that you'd like to go into, you can be part of a network that's actually bringing information to you. So you're scrolling through your feed and you're finding out uh, you know, who are the major uh, players who's financing this work? What kinds of professional development or continuing education opportunities are there, especially after you graduate and those things aren't quite as uh, readily at your fingertips? Uh, when you create your profile, I also suggest that you add the little badge that goes around your photo that says open to network. Uh, it's really uh, just makes it a little bit easier. It's a way of raising your hand and saying, I'm interested in, in talking. And when you create your LinkedIn profile, you want to try to pick a, a professional photo. You want to use that space at the top, the about me description to talk about yourself in a way that's interesting, quick, punchy, and uh, builds your credibility. And then to actually do your outreach. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit in the exercise section, but I have a set of pre-drafted uh, short welcome intro messages that I keep handy. So when I find someone who I'm interested in connecting to, I already know what I'm going to say. And it's not letting uh, time go by because I, I wanna make sure that I utilize my time as effectively as I can. So a couple of general uh, networking tips before we um, get to the conclusion and, and then I'd like to open it up for questions. So networking tips, don't be afraid to ask for what you want and to ask for help. I think the number one thing that people worry about when it comes to networking is that they feel like they don't know enough to engage someone, but that's exactly why you network. It doesn't matter how successful you are, you know, how much education you have, how much money you have. There's always a space of ignorance just beyond whatever it is that we know. So everyone is looking to find ways to learn about new spaces, new career paths, and new opportunities. So you want to be in the position to say, you know what, I don't know, and that's part of why I'm networking. Rather than that being a, a drawback or something that you should be hesitant about, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to engage someone's expertise. And generally speaking, people are flattered when you reach out to them and see them as an expert and you want to speak with them. And if you're networking, just say you know what it is that you're looking for. If you say, I'm a student, I'm about to graduate, I'm looking for a job, or uh, maybe you're not about to graduate, but you're looking for a paid internship. Just being really clear about what it is that you what it is that you want is important. You might say, no, I'm an aspiring woman entrepreneur, and I want to learn from other women who have done this before me. Uh, it also shows respect for the person's time because you've thought about why you want to engage with them in particular. You've thought through what kinds of questions you want to ask them. And you're also really, again, making good use of their time and not beating around the bush. And that allows you to come from a position of strength. Also keep in mind that everyone has something to offer. Uh, I remember when I was in college and when I just got out of college, it's a little tricky because you say, well, I have a piece of my education down, but no, I don't have a lot of work experience. What do I offer? Or uh, I'm looking for a mentor, but I, you know, what do I have to give to that person? Everyone has something to offer. So approaching networking instead of as something that's kind of awkward or transactional or extractive, but instead uh, going towards it as something that is an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity to create a virtuous cycle. Everyone has something that they can offer. And don't feel that just because you're a little younger or because you don't have as much working experience that networking is not something that can be a two-way street for you. 
mentioned this before, but it's important to, to make sure that you know who knows that you do what you do. You can have an awesome LinkedIn profile, great entrepreneurial experience that you're developing, but then you get to a point where you say, you know what, if people don't know that I have this particular skill set, or they don't know that I'm looking to make certain kinds of connections or uh, open up certain opportunities, then they can't help you. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice I got from an administrator when I was in college was to tell your business. Uh, you want to be, of course, a little selective about who you say what to, but you have to enlist people in the process of helping you get to your goals. That is part of that opening up and getting past any weirdness that you might feel. And then practicing your pitch. And your pitch could be an actual pitch, like a pitch deck if you're looking for funding, or the pitch could just be uh, what you write in a LinkedIn uh, message to someone that you're meeting for the first time, or it could be in any sort of networking event. Just what are the one or two things that you want to say about who you are, your personal story, and what matters to you? And then finally, maintain relationships. Uh, networking is a lot like exercise. You can't like run a marathon and then say, well, I ran that marathon, so I'm good for the next year. I don't have to work out. I don't have to lift weights. I don't have to do yoga. I, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine now. It's a constant process. Once you make connections, it's also about maintaining them. And that could be just dropping an email or sending a message every couple of months and say, hi, how are you doing? I saw you wrote this cool article on LinkedIn and I shared that with people in my network or congratulations on the book you publish. Just keeping that uh, positive energy going is uh, helpful. And then once you network in that way, it becomes a lot more like maintaining a professional friendship than it is something that's a little uh, more awkward. So finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about clients and then open it for questions. So when you're engaging clients, uh, the really it gets down to, do they trust me to solve their problem? If people don't trust you, if they don't trust you as a person, they don't trust your operation, they don't trust your work ethic or your practices, it doesn't matter what uh, the problem is or how much money they are willing to pay you or not pay you. If there isn't mutual trust, uh, an entrepreneurial relationship doesn't work. Part of what makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur is that you're doing something that is different, new, novel, and untested. If you are doing something that millions of people have done before you, using the blueprint that you know to be successful, then you're a small business owner. You're not necessarily an entrepreneur. And that's okay, but entrepreneurship is intertwined with a level of risk taking. So if there isn't something new and novel and untested, and you aren't actively trying to build trust in uh, the other person or the other party to trust you to solve their problem, then what you're doing might not fully be entrepreneurship. You also wanna ask, what is the cheapest, easiest way to get practical experience? Uh, sometimes people don't want to be the first. They don't want to be your guinea pig. They just want to know someone else did it so that they can say, oh, okay, it's, it's trusted, it's tested, the product works, the service works, great. So thinking about what is the cheapest, easiest way to get practical experience. It might be volunteer work. It might be a paid internship. It might be pitching yourself to a hiring manager and saying, no, I'm going to start off doing this work freelance, but can I parlay this into a full-time opportunity? You want to just think about how you start small. And then what is the standard of, of service delivery in your field? Is this something that you can deliver entirely online? Is this something that you uh, have to show up in person for? Is this something that people are looking for a digital product as opposed to an analog product? So just understanding what other people in the field typically do or provide is important. And then the core business model and what do I charge? I come from a consulting background and that's probably the number one question that I get. How do you know how to put a dollar amount on your time? This is also important because you know, if you're a woman entrepreneur or a person of color or a woman of color, you don't wanna accidentally put yourself in the position of undervaluing your work. And when you're starting off, you might say, well, I don't know a lot, I'm practicing. Um, people are taking a little bit of a, of a risk with uh, engaging me or my services. So how do I know? The way that I think about it is a balance between what an hourly rate should be and also how to internalize all the externalities. So I'm not doing it now because of the pandemic, but if I have to travel, what is the cost of my travel time? 
uh, what is the opportunity cost in the trade-off? If I have to write proposals or do pre-work before I actually land a contract, how many hours am I going to spend doing background research or writing up a, a budget or a template for that client? So just trying to internalize all of the externalities and then also just doing your research and seeing what are people in my field who are providing my service generally charging, and then you move it around there. And the core business model might be based on selling a product. So you're thinking about your unit economics, how much does it cost to produce this? And what am I selling it for? What's my profit margin? Or it might be something that's more service or project-based like what I do. So how do people find me and see my work? If you're a creative, maybe you're using Instagram. If you are a, a consultant or maybe part of a service-driven network, are there associations that you can be a part of? So people have to be able to find you. And when you're really in the space of networking actively, you are creating a space where other people can find you. So you're not spending all your time trying to find them. And then finally, how can I under-promise and over-deliver? In a perfect world, you're able to always exceed people's expectations, which is great. Uh, leave them wanting a, a little bit more, even as you're delivering a great product. Uh, but the process is also thinking about how do we create or, or bridge that gap between expectations and reality? So maybe I ordered a t-shirt from a new organic fair trade cotton t-shirt company. And then it's like, well, you know, people said that it was good. My expectations based on the reviews were here. But Maybe there were things that had added value that I didn't think about, like amazing customer service or free shipping or something else that improves the quality of the experience and makes it more likely for me to want to be a repeat customer. Figuring out how to close that gap between expectations and reality and continue to level up is something that clients are, are generally looking for. And when you are running a business, whether it's you know brick and mortar or something that's online or, or more service-based, the goal is to always uh, figure out how to get repeat clients. It's the most money you're going to spend is on cultivating that initial client. So anything you can do to maintain those relationships, to keep them happy, and to get to that all-important referral, <laughs> that is always the holy grail. When someone says, oh, that new restaurant in my neighborhood is amazing, um, you should go with me and we'll like get takeout, we'll eat you know, curbside, socially distant, that's the kind of thing that you can't pay for. So you can, you know, maybe do likes on Facebook, you can try to get on the like local news in a food segment, but nothing is more powerful than that repeat business that you get from people saying, this was a great experience, the product was great, the service was great, I'm going to support. So I have a couple exercises, um, I can share these slides later, but um, you can screenshot this as well. A couple of things I think might help to get you started. So one that I find really uh, useful that I also use in my class is the eight word mission statement. Uh, SSIR is the Stanford Social Innovation Review. They are a fantastic and mostly free resource to find different articles about nonprofits, startups, social enterprises, business development, but from the social angle. You can just Google uh, SSIR eight word mission statement if, uh, if it doesn't pop up directly from that URL. And it's a good way of, of practicing how to create an eight word mission statement. We love to talk a lot about why we're interesting and the things that we're working on, but realistically, people just want you to get to the point. We are all bombarded by a ton of different media, many different outlets, and it can be hard to compete for space and to compete for attention. So thinking about how to write a personal mission statement that is short and punchy, and then maybe also a mission statement for your business or your entrepreneurial venture. That's a one place to start. You can also create the sentence of, of I achieve X relative to Y by doing Z. This really gets down to your value proposition and your positioning statement rolled together. So you're achieving a certain standard of service or quality of product relative to the average, what, what else you could get in the, uh, in the marketplace by doing Z. That is the, the transformational part. What is unique about your approach or your product? And being able to explain that also is a way of getting across what your theory of change is. Because your theory of change is that that Z, that secret sauce, is something that's going to make a difference. 
Also building an inbound information ecosystem and surrounding yourself with thought leadership. This in a nutshell is what I was saying before about the importance of creating and surrounding yourself by positive like-minded people who are trying to be successful in your chosen field. You wanna make sure that you are, let's say, signing up for email lists of companies that you wanna follow. You are setting alerts. Uh, if you're job hunting, you're putting that kind of alert in as well. So figuring out how to get information to come to you so that it's showing up in your inbox, it's on your phone, it's accessible in a way that you can constantly scan and see who are the key players, what's uh, the new trend that's going on in the field I'm interested in, what are funding opportunities. So creating a system so that you can get information coming to you is also a good way of finding who you want to network with. And then finally, uh, a network mapping exercise. So making a list of all the formal and informal networks and communities that you're a part of. Uh, when I talk particularly to students, they say, well, you know, I'm young, I don't have a lot of experience. Like, who do I really know? Everyone is part of a network. It could be your school network and by extension, alumni of Baruch. Uh, maybe you're in a fraternity or sorority. That's another network, a pre-professional group. Like, let's say you're an engineer and you're part of the National Black Society of uh, National Society of Black Engineers, or maybe you did a fellowship, maybe you're part of a church or a synagogue, everyone has a network. So you never know that person who, uh, who like lives next door to you or the person who was part of um, a program that you did, uh, part of Baruch or, or in any other uh, program, there might be ways for you to build connections. So just taking an inventory of all the systems that you're part of. Then identifying a handful of people who you would like to connect with, because it starts with that initial conversation. And if you're a little nervous about networking, that can be a really good way to start. Someone who knows you, someone who you have something in common with, it just lowers the stress level and it makes it a little easier for you to get started. So then draft email messages for cold outreach. And that's this cold outreach could be over uh, over LinkedIn, or maybe you make a connection with someone and a friend says, oh, sure, I can forward your information. Having that little blurb ready to go is helpful. A mini bio, a link to your profile, if you have a website or social media handles, having that handy just makes it a little bit more of a plug and play. And then you can scale that up when you have a little time to devote to networking. Uh, mentors and personal board of directors. Uh, it can be tough to find a mentor. It can be tough to maintain a relationship with one person. So I also offer the idea of a personal board of directors. This could be a group of people, five people, 10 people, however you want to structure it, whatever kind of uh, setup works for you. But it's a group of people who you feel are dedicated to your professional development and helping you to network. So you can set it up in whichever way you like, but you might say, well, I'm going to try in 2021 to have a personal board of directors. Uh, these are my personal goals. And it's also a way of having accountability. So someone might say, okay, well, have you finished that LinkedIn profile since the last time I talked to you? And that's also how you can set up a monthly networking goal. It could be something simple, like one new conversation a month, just one over the phone or over Zoom, um, and just creating a system to track your progress. This could be an app you download, maybe something in, um, in Google Drive, you're setting it up, but being able to track your progress and see how many new people am I talking to? Can I do something to increase the number of people that I reach out to? Is there a free scheduling system? So maybe instead of wasting time going back and forth, trying to find time on someone's calendar, I send them a link. I personally use Calendly, uh, it's a great system. There's also a free version. Anything that takes out the friction from someone being able to connect with you or uh, anything you can do to make it even easier for someone to connect with you can be very helpful. So the, I, I hope that these are just some actionable tools that give you some context around how to uh, get started. So I'm happy to take questions. I can go back through the slides and show you something else. And um, I see that there are some questions in the chat box. So Marlene, maybe sh I should start with those or? Please go ahead. I actually have my own question at the end too. So, but thank you so much. You've given us some great tips so far. Um, let's start with Tim. Tim has a pricing tip first. We have found that asking the client if they are, have a spending budget or reviewing their spending from a previous year or similar budget can lead to a better pricing position. So instead of thinking from a per hour value, you can reverse engineer with the budget in mind and leverage your time that way. Do you think that this tactic makes sense? Absolutely. 
uh, this is a tactic that I also use myself, uh, particularly because I work in the nonprofit and startup space. Even if the idea has potential, I'm typically dealing with organizations that have smaller budgets. So they are very budget conscious. I ask up front, what do you have dedicated? Because there's no point in me spending time creating a $50,000 contract or package when all they have to spend is $5,000. So asking upfront and getting really comfortable with that. And the way that I uh, package it is to say that my goal is to get them as much bang for their buck and to perhaps put things into phases. So if you can start with something that is smaller initially and say, well, here's the low hanging fruit. Here's how I can push the first domino and get momentum in your system so that it makes it more possible for you to be successful in this space so that we can move on to a phase two or a phase three. That's definitely how I look at it. And you know, for what it's worth, people are great, but they might also uh, <laughs> kind of waste your time when it comes to being an entrepreneur or they ask for this much, but they know that they have a budget that's this much. So getting people to get honest as early as possible about what they are willing to spend or what uh, the potential trade-offs are is also good. I say, you know, what what is the cost of not solving this problem? So they might say, well, I don't have the budget to do what you were asking me to, to do in this proposal. But I say, well, if you don't do it, how is that going to affect the other parts of your business? And then that makes them readjust their thinking. I'm going to piggyback off of that question and add whether, do you think it's a good tactic to create those milestones so that there's an upsell when they're ready to move on? And that's a great way to have this reoccurring client continue in your system. I say definitely. It's also part of the story because the thing that they might be working on with you initially is small potatoes. It might be more of a nuts and bolts thing that they have to do. So being able to provide a sense of your vision for their company and having them see you not just as a consultant or as a contractor or a service provider, but as someone who is committed to their growth and development as a business owner or as a product or service is critical. So even if you don't get to that pie in the sky vision, you're at least showing that you understand how they see the potential in their own work and their own business. Uh, another question from Tim, gaining experience, consider being a subcontractor. Larger firms usually accept contracts that include services that they do not provide. So instead of being a small business or solopreneur, you can leverage your service skills product as a subcontractor to help the larger firm achieve their contractual obligations. He would like to hear some feedback on this concept from you. Definitely. So part of how I work, so I'm basically a, a solo entrepreneur. I have an LLC. Uh, I didn't mention it before, but I also recommend that if you're seriously thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, don't wait to set up your LLC. Uh, some people like to set it up where they live. Like I'm based in New York. Some people go the Delaware route. It doesn't matter how you do it, but setting up an LLC is not only your first commitment to yourself and your own entrepreneurial journey, uh, but it's also an opportunity for you to engage a potential client on a more equal footing. So you're not a freelancer, you're not doing something as part of a gig economy, you're a business owner. And whether or not you start running projects through your company is, is almost a, a side issue, but it allows you to at least set up a, a, a visual, a visible presence. Uh, when it comes to the partnership, Part of what I do networking for is to find other small businesses like mine so that when I, let's say, hear about a larger project, I am able to put together a team and say, well, my expertise is in this area, but here are two or three other companies that I can partner with. So together we create a bigger uh, footprint or we can cover more work. Um, I have found also that clients like the idea of big comprehensive services. It makes them feel like they're in good hands, but that doesn't mean that if you contract with a large company, that the person who pitches you the work or the owner of the company is going to be the one doing the work. Often it's going to get subcontracted or it's going to get pushed down to a newer or greener employee anyway. So what I lead with is if you uh, work with me. If you like my style, you're getting me. Yeah, I'm not passing it off elsewhere. So part of it is trying to change the dynamic around why a, a smaller shop could be a better route for you, but then it's also showing that you have the ability to expand capacity when you need it. 
Victoria has a question. How important is updating your LinkedIn feed when networking with the connections you currently have? And what do you re recommend sharing on our personal feeds? That's a great question. So I think if you set up your LinkedIn profile with good bones from the start, then what you're doing is updating or tweaking. Like if you graduate, you want to obviously say, I graduated, I finished. Uh, if you are developing any products or services and you want to say, well, here I am getting featured in my school newspaper or you know, a local business is carrying my product, you want to be able to share those kinds of updates. Uh, in terms of the, the connections that you currently have, what I find is that the, the LinkedIn profile is really like an initial resume. A resume doesn't get you a job. It just gets you in the door to be considered for whatever the future rounds are. I tend to not check the LinkedIn profiles of people that I'm already connected to because I know it's there. So when I'm checking that profile, it's because I want to make a connection to someone or because I want to talk to that person about connecting to someone who they know. So it's really valuable for the people who don't know you and that is their quick and easy way of, of finding out about you from a Google search. Uh, from a maintenance standpoint, I try to say maybe once a month or so, just seeing, uh, do I have a different language or framing or description of my work? Uh, can I reorganize things in a way that make it easier to understand what my background is? Uh, the thought leadership piece every now and then, I don't do it very often, but I write you know, an article and I share that. And I also, also post um, different events that I'm involved with. So it might be um, a new webinar or um, something that's going on with one of my schools. So I'm constantly putting content so that people start to associate a post that they see in a particular kind of content with me. So then uh, they might say, oh, well, I met Lauren five years ago at a conference. We haven't really kept in touch, but I like what she's putting out there. I like that. I also use it as a repository of the things that I do and they just pile up and you forget to add them when you're ready to really display them. Right. Shawana's asking, um, she says, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the Delaware route. As a class project, we learned different states are different for LLC. Is it best to seek out professional help seeking uh, professional help to have LLCs and how to determine that help? That's a great question. So um, I worked with my accountant to set up my LLC and my decision was really pretty easy to put it in New York. I see there's also another question related to Delaware. People like the, you know, the no income tax thingy with Delaware. That's why it's attractive. But for me, I'm a native New Yorker. I'm born and raised here. I live here. This is where I operate my business. Why do I want to go and make my life more complicated and have to have representation in another state or know what the laws are in another state when I could be keeping it simple here in New York? Um, in terms of the, the process of getting started, you can go on LegalZoom and set up your own LLC. Uh, the only thing that I really paid for in, in an outsourcing way with um, with uh, my business set up back in 2015 was around the LLC and it was a couple hundred bucks, not that expensive. But I did my own uh, privacy policy for my website. I wrote that myself. I filed several trademark applications on my own through LegalZoom. And part of the, the benefit I think of not necessarily having startup capital is that you push yourself to figure out how to do or learn a lot of things on your own. And I think you'd be pleasantly surprised as to what you can self teach. So when it comes to uh, starting the LLC, you still need to figure out, well, what is the name of my business? What are my core services? Which area do I fall under uh, in terms of filing, if, assuming that you're going to do it in New York State? And it just, it, it creates a starting point and a platform. Can you also do that if you have intentions for a certain business, like consulting is part of my future portfolio. I do it ad hoc now, not for, for not as a business, but I eventually want to do that. Can I LLC pre really starting that business? Yeah. So I, I think that having a sense of of what you want to do and why is important because it still is a commitment of time and money. Uh, 
I personally, let's say like I wouldn't start a t-shirt company. So I'm not going to create an LLC to park it to create a business that I'm not actually interested in. So I think there should be a, a general level of conversation that you have with yourself about what you are looking to do within your business. But what I think you'll find is that once you take that first step, it makes it more likely that you'll take a second step and a third step and a fourth step. Also thinking about the business development work and having uh, an LLC as part of you know, your strategy allows you to start writing off business development expenses. So when you are, let's say you're traveling for work so that you can drum up clients or you're going to a conference to expand your network, those are things that you can write off as a business owner that you can't as an independent person who is just doing that work directly. Um, and just a, another thing around trademarks. So for me, it was important up front to set up my business, come up with a name, decide what kind of consulting I wanted to do. And going into the trademark process also forced me to get really clear about what I wanted to do, because you have to trademark under specific categories and each category is different and they all cost money. So if you trademark under five different categories, it's more expensive than if you trademark under one category. So that process really forced me to think strategically about what kinds of services I would want. And that was also part of why I did it. And then um, setting up a website early and making sure that it was that exercise of talking directly in a digital space about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it um, made it easier so that I wasn't fumbling around when I was talking to clients. I'm going to ask you one last question. I know we're over time, everyone, but this one is the one that nags me the most. Do you have any tips for imposter syndrome? That's a good question. So personally, I think I'm, I'm fortunate to not be in that headspace myself when it comes to imposter syndrome, maybe one of the things to think is that if you think you have imposter syndrome, imagine how many other people feel the same way. So you're never alone mm -hmm. in that space. The other is that it's just because you're starting off and you're younger and you're earlier stage in your career does not mean that you're faking it. You are evolving into a version of an entrepreneur that maybe you've always thought that you wanted to be. So it doesn't mean that because you're in the early stages that you are an imposter. You are just figuring out how to try on this new character or this new professional persona for size. Uh, the other thing I think is that's important just psychologically is around affirmations because any kind of entrepreneurship, you're taking a risk, you're doing something untested, you're going to have challenges, you might fail, you might have to pick yourself up again and start over. So it's not an imposter space to be throwing yourself way out into the deep end and doing something that quite frankly, most people don't have the courage to do. That to me is the complete opposite of what I think of when I think of an imposter. Someone who is bold and taking risks is in no way an imposter. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, we appreciate your time today, everyone. We appreciate your time as well. Um, the recording will be sent out within the next uh, day or two. We will also include the slides and um, I thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Marlene, for the invitation. Take care, everyone. Take care, bye-bye.